Well, amen. That's what we want to do is worship Jesus Christ. If you're visiting this morning, I want you to know we're going to talk about some things today that will like seem pretty strange. And the reason they seem so strange is God's ways are not our ways. God's holy and just and good. And friends, you and I come into the world and we're, in, um, we're, we're born into sin. And, and then, you know, it doesn't take very long. If you've ever had a kid or you've ever babysat a kid, you know it doesn't take very long to find out they're little sinners, right? And if you don't believe it, all you got to do is go like work in the nursery. Just one, one day in the nursery, in the church nursery, you'll know there's a lot of sinners around here. The good news is Jesus Christ came so that we might have forgiveness of sins, so we might be reconciled to God, so we might have a place in heaven, so we might be adopted into God's family, joint heirs with the Lord Jesus Christ, and in so doing that you and I might live different, think different, conduct ourselves in a way that's pleasing to Him. And that's really what we want to do here is passionately pursue Jesus Christ. So we want to welcome you. Well, hey, just really quick, just a couple quick things that are coming up. Uh, we got the Uganda team. They're going to be sharing a, kind of an update. This is Saturday night, September 28th. We'll have the, the evening service, Saturday evening service. Then we're going to have the Holy Bird. So we've got the Holy Book, then the Holy Bird, and then the Holy Report. And we're going to have uh, chicken, Chick-fil-A that night. So plan on being there. Get signed up. Uh, you need to make reservations so we get enough chicken sandwiches here. Anyways, it's going to be awesome. And then also, if you're a senior, now I know you're not. You are way too young to be a senior. But there's, there might be a senior sitting next to you. Right now, just reach over and put your hand on their shoulder, okay? Or maybe they're in front of you. That's for you, okay? That's, that's, we're, we're, we're communicating with a little love here. All right, ladies, want to make sure we invite you. Jara's been working on this. She's really excited about uh, Saturday the 21st. Get signed up. Plan to be there. Well, you probably watched the debate this week, and uh, the, uh, all, all I'll say is this. It's interesting to me when you watch and you ask yourself the question, is this the best that the free world has to offer? <laughs> it's sad, friends. It's sad. Especially if you go back and look in history. And I was, I was amazed. It was September 10th was the debate this last week. September 11th was the next day. And not one comment about September 11th. There was discussion about the democracy and about the dangers, threats to democracy. And those were, quite honestly, pointed more towards people who are followers of Jesus in the country in some ways than outside. We talk more in details about that. But what's interesting to me is the total blindness to the reality that there are people outside the United States that would love to see America destroyed. Let me say it this way. Would love to see you dead. You say, Mark, that's harsh. That's unloving. Friends, you and I have been told that there are peaceful religions around the world. And you remember on 9-11, 23 years ago, planes being hijacked, people flying into buildings, and they're, and they're blessing Allah as they do it. They see themselves as fulfilling the great jihad, and 3,000 Americans die. And you know, it, what's, what's amazing is we have 370 million people living in America. Now we have this huge segment that doesn't even remember this because they were born after 9-11. And you hear them, you know, you hear people talking about America and the Middle East and how dare we were there. Friends, there's a reason we were there. This is why. It's because there's evil people in the world who want to kill people. And, you know, we saw last October Hamas attacking Israel. It's still there. It's always going to be there. The conflict will be there until Jesus comes and he fixes it all. The Prince of Peace will come. But between now and then, you know, the reality is, is we're going to have conflict in the world. And some of you haven't even seen this. So this is what I want to do is I want to take just a couple minutes. I want to show you this because this is real. This isn't like watching a movie and like, oh, that's nice. You know, it's fiction. We go home, have popcorn. Everything's wonderful. This is real. This is, this is what people are plotting and planning to do. Something like this to harm America, harm you, harm your kids, harm your grandkids and generations to come. Watch this. Hey Beth, 
Well, what is that? Something, somebody hit uh, the World Trade Center or the... It's a trade center. The World trade, trade Center. center. Too. Yeah. This just in, you are looking at a breaking news story very to tell you about. Line shot there. That is the know, World Trade Center, know, and we have just unconfirmed reports this morning. Some sort of explosion, explosion and crash. As we come on out, we have serious news of a major, very tragic event for the world. Incredible plane crash into the World Trade Center. I just heard a loud boom. You, you did? Was it a plane? That's what I was thinking. It was a terrorist attack. Immediately, there's speculation or cause for concern. This is the World Trade Center that was the center of a terrorist bombing right. some years ago. So the questions have to be asked, was this a purely an accident or could this have been an intentional act? But either way, extensive damage was What's this other jet doing? What's what the the jet doing? Holy oh, my oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god. Looks like six, seven floors were taken out. And there's more oh, explosions there's, oh, right now. Hold on, people are running. Wait, hold, so hold on. Hold on just a moment. We've got an explosion inside. The building's that... exploding right now. You got people running up the street. Okay. Hold on, I'll tell you what's going on. Right. Oh my God! Another plane has just hit. It hit another building. Flew right into the middle of it. Explosion. My God! It's right in the middle of the building. And when that happened, people danced and celebrated, and they blessed the God that they worship across the world. Theology matters. There's only really two kingdoms: God's kingdom and Satan's kingdom, and and so, when you see this, when you remember this, when you hear about this, I think there's like f at least four things that stood out to me as I was thinking about 9-11, and again, the fact that it was totally missed in the debate. And that is, as followers of the Lord Jesus, we, wh wherever country we're born in, we should be telling the people in that country, and you know, in our case, America, that the fear of the Lord matters, that the hand of God rises up nations and kings and removes them, Daniel chapter 2. And then if a nation or a king or a leader, religious leader, a, a, a political leader, is, is shaking, their fist at the hand, at, uh, shaking their fist at God, there's consequences to that. John the Baptist did this with Herod. You remember he shook his fist at God and said that he can do whatever he wants morally. He's the king. And so he takes his uh, brother's wife, commits adultery. John the Baptist says, hey, you know, in America today, if a politician does that, I say, well, whatever a person does in their private life, that's up to them. That's funny. John the Baptist, as a prophet, Jesus said, went and said, you know that's sin. You know that's evil. It's not the path of blessing. He was thrown in jail and beheaded for it. How many of you remember the story of Jonah? Jonah was sent to a world power and, and told him, 40 days, God's going to destroy that nation. Well, who is God? God's the creator and sustainer of all things. When a people do not fear God. You remember what Proverbs 14 says? It says that um, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a shame to any people. Not just Israel, not just to the church, but to any people. And so when you live in a nation that shakes its fist at God, and, you know, whether it's on the subject of abortion or being uh, anti-Semitic or... Um, uh, you think about the, the, the educational system that now is not only with the intent was to create a, a situation where our children would learn to read and to write and to think, and, and from our founding fathers, they would be able to read the Bible so that they would not be deceived by the devil. It's all rooted in Christianity there, but today it's, it's an education not in reading and writing so that you might know God, fear God, turn away from evil, and, and make good decisions, but now they graduate and they cannot read, but they are experts in immorality, in sensuality, in sexual perversion. I, I'm, just, I'm just saying we should fear God because God exalts nations and He removes them. Do you remember what Jesus said? Uh, Jesus was so political. He, he was uh, talking about John the Baptist and when he got beheaded saying, you know, how great a prophet he was. And he says, woe unto you Capernaum. That was the city that he lived in and, and taught out of for 18 months. And he says, it will be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah Sodom and Gomorrah were those two cities that 
Jesus destroyed back in Genesis 19 because of their immorality. So more, it'll be more uh, tolerable for them on the day of judgment than for you, Capernaum, for the deeds that have been done in you. In other words, all the miracles that Jesus had done in Capernaum had been done there. In other words, him speaking out, him showing the glory and majesty of God. It was going to be gr- a greater judgment from the hand of God on them than even Sodom and Gomorrah. I mean, there's a lot of examples of that in the Bible. We should be telling people to fear God. It's, no, it's, it's not a safe thing, America, to be shaking your fist at God. Building a strong econ- economy. Say, so what does that got to do with the Bible? Well, if you read 1 Samuel, you'll find that there was uh, a time in Israel's history where they said, we want to be like everybody else, and we want to have big government. And, and remember, God sent a prophet and said, when you do that, you will suffer under taxation, and you will not prosper. It will be exactly the opposite. But they said, we want this. And it led to their own destruction. Strong economies matter. Um, socialism is not going to be a path to prosperity. It's not the prosperity of, uh, that the Bible describes to us and describes how nations can prosper. Maintaining a, a world-class military. You know, today, if, if we talk about military, people say, you know, you're just a warmonger. Do you know when you look through the Bible, you find out that nations come and go, and part of that is based on their economy, whether or not they can have a strong enough military to keep their foes at bay. There's this guy by the name of Belshazzar in the Bible. You can read about him in Genesis or uh, Daniel, Daniel, Daniel chapter 5. And he's the king of the greatest empire in the world at that time, the Babylonian Empire. Um, he was a, the, the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar who had destroyed Jerusalem and, and, and uh, carried off the Jews. And he was in his walled city. He, was, he felt totally secure, but the Medes and the Persians, that was the second largest uh, uh, empire at the time, was, was at the door. And, and, and God said, because you're in there partying and because you've rejected me, he sent Daniel the prophet to warn them. And he says, tonight your, your empire will be destroyed. And that night they were destroyed just as God has said. Um, you know, Ronald Reagan one time said, America has never gotten into war because it was weak. America has gotten into war, um, never got into war when it was strong, but it's gotten into war when it was weak. And that's true. That's exactly what you see in the Old Testament that matters. And cultivating patriotism. You know, patriotism is really just a, a, a fancy word for loyalty. You think about families. And what does it take to have a great family? Loyalty. The loyalty of the husband to the wife. The loyalty of the wife to her husband. The loyalty of them to their family to make sacrifices and decisions to have a strong family. Churches are the same way. You have to have loyalty. You've got to have loyalty of leaders. You've got to have loyalty of, 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 of the staff, depending on the size of the church. You've got to have... Um, People being loyal, coming together, seeking the Lord Jesus Christ, serving one another, caring for one another, um, sacrificing one another for the furtherance of the gospel. That's what it takes. It takes loyalty to have, have a healthy church. Unhealthy churches don't have loyalty. A nation is the same exact way. You have to have patriotism. You have to have loyalty. And you know, as you have the deterioration of the nuclear family, again, because we don't fear God and we see that across uh, the United States everywhere, and you attack the nuclear family, we'll talk more about that in just a moment, patriotism decreases. Because how do you get loyalty, whether it's in a family? How is that passed on to generation? How is that passed on in churches? How is that passed on into nations? You have to have loyalty. So families getting together and being thankful for the country that they're in, whatever that country is, and then being thankful, and then them recognizing they've made sacrifices so that their neighbors and families around them, their church family, etc., would have a level of security and so forth. And that patriotism of gratitude and thanksgiving to God for what they have and, and, and what they've experienced and what they've known and is, is a matter of patriotism. You know, when this took place, to, to catch the difference, 181,000 men signed up for the military immediately. Um, immediately, 74,000 joined the reserves. Today, the military, 20, this is 23 years ago, today, the military is under, under um, the recruiting numbers are 45,000 under what we even need to maintain the army. And you say, what has happened? The breakdown of the nuclear family creates dissatisfaction, disloyalty, irresponsibility, and it trickles all the way out into the nation. Even West Point, and I shared this with you earlier this year, breaks my heart. For over 100 years, West Point's motto was, duty, honor, country. Country, patriotism. And they've removed those three words because the goal today is to raise people who are not patriots of the United States or whatever country they're from, but, um, but globalists. And so we see, again, this deterioration, and you can't build a nation that way. I mean, 
In order to build a strong nation, it doesn't matter if it's America or any place else, the people need to have a fear of God. There needs to be a strong economy. You can't do it the world's way. God's economy with money is totally different. Maintain a, a, a strong military and have patriotism. If you don't have these sorts of things, a country cannot stand. That's why you and I should pray, and I just want you to know the answers are in the Bible. The solutions are in the Bible, but our, our local officials, our state officials, our federal officials, they seem not to write, read the Bible much anymore. And they seem not to have much of a worldview, a godly worldview anymore. And that's why you and I are salt and light. Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the solution. This book has, has the direction, whether you're trying to build a family, you're trying to build a church, you're trying to build a nation, you're trying to build a community. The answers are in this book. And uh, you won't find it anywhere else. Father, I just pray uh, for America. I just pray that we would be salt and light in this generation, that we would live godly in Christ Jesus, that we would hold forth the Word of God. And whether we're talking about finances or patriotism or any of these things that that are so necessary for a country, education, for example, um, that, God, you've already given us the answers. God, thank you for giving us the answers, giving us a level of peace with that. Thank you that you've made a promise that Jesus is coming back and he will set up the millennial kingdom. And one day, all these things will be right. There won't be any more threats. There'll be a new heavens, a new earth where there is no curse, no more death, no more wars, no more uh, strife. God, we look forward to that day. And we know it's something only you can bring. Governments can't bring that. Individuals in this world can't bring that, but you can bring that. So we look forward. Come, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, let me invite you to turn with me to Colossians. Turn with me to Colossians. Colossians chapter 3. And uh, uh, I remember as a little boy, I was living with my grandparents. My mom came and picked me up. I don't remember what the occasion was, but I came running out of the house, and I got up to the car. I opened the door, and she says, hi, go change your clothes. Now, I thought I was, I thought I was fine. I had my favorite worn-out blue jeans on. I mean, how many of you know that worn out, faded blue jeans are better than new blue jeans? Someone say amen. And, and I, had a, I, had, so I had my worn out blue jeans on, I had a white t-shirt on, and I had a denim jacket on that was, that was matching my faded blue jeans. I mean, I looked like I just stepped out of a John Wayne movie. And it was just, you know, and I thought I was just like, you know, dressed to the hilt. I mean, it was good enough for John Wayne, it's good enough for me. So... Um, my mom, my mom just took one look. She said, go change right now. Go put on some new clothes. And that's the metaphor that's in this section. So really from Colossians chapter 5, or Colossians chapter 3, verse 5, through verse 15, is you're going to have to take off the old clothes and you've got to put on the new clothes. There's something to discard and there's something to put on. And it's going to start with this. You start with realizing that you've got to kill the members of your body in regarding sexual temptation. God cares about sexuality. God cares about morality. And then he's going to say, now look, take off the old clothes, take off the bitterness, take off the wrath, take off the contempt you've had for other people and other groups of people and the tribalism. Man, this is a really important verse for our day. And then you put on something that's completely different. Love, joy, peace, faithfulness, and these characteristics of kindness that are reflected in the character and nature of God. So we're going we're gonna to be looking at all this over the next couple of weeks. Follow along there as I read Colossians chapter 3, starting in verse 5. It says, therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as what? Dead. Man, this is, this is a violent action that you and I are supposed to take, not towards others, like we saw, uh, you know, in 9-11 where people did violent actions towards others. We're supposed to do something violent towards ourselves. We're supposed to make sure that the members of our body, our eyes, our hands, etc., do not be involved in sensual, evil rebellion towards God, that you and I are to mortify the flesh. It says, consider the members of your earthly body as dead. To what? Immorality, impurity, passions, evil desires, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. For it is because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. And in them you also once walked. That's your former life when you were living in them. Verse 8, but now... That's the past. But now you also put them all aside, take them off, throw off the old garments of anger and wrath and malice and slander and abusive speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices. And put on, there's the new clothes, put on the new self which is being renewed in a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. 
a renewal in which there is no distinction. Notice here, the hostility is going to end as we put away the wrath and malice towards other people groups, this tribalism that you and I are seeing across America, the vision that we're seeing. Look at this. There's no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barren, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and in all. Father, I just pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart might be acceptable in your sight. And God, we pray that this passage might resonate in our hearts so that Jesus might have preeminence in our lives in every area, including this area of morality. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Look here with me at this, this chart. Remember this? We've seen the supremacy of Christ over creation, and people say amen. That's a theological reality that Jesus created all things, and therefore He's the head of all things, and all things were made by Him, for Him, and for His glory. We saw that Jesus was over all religions, and we've talked about that. Now we're talking about the supremacy or the lordship of Jesus Christ over our own lives. You know, you've often heard people say, oh, I believe in Jesus, and, and Jesus is Lord. I mean, you've seen it on bumper stickers. Jesus is Lord, but if you look at their driving... You'd wonder, right? And so the question is, is Jesus Lord of your life in your thinking? Verses 1 through 4 there of chapter 3. We said, Remember, it says, think on the things that are above where Christ is. Pursue the things that are above. Okay, that's what we're going to do. Well, what does that look like? Well, we're going to talk about conduct and morality. And then we're going to talk about our homes and the workplace and in prayer. What does the lordship of Jesus Christ look like? And what I want you to catch with me is the lordship of Jesus Christ is manifested in how you conduct yourself morally, sexually, and it's going to contrast everything in the world. Look at what it says there in verse 5. It says, therefore, consider, think, the members of your body as dead. Remember what Jesus said? If your eye causes you to sin, what did he say? Pluck it out. He says, if your hand causes you to sin, what? Cut it off. And what he's, it's a hyperbole there. What he's saying there is, is you need to take drastic measures so that you do not sin against God, so that you do not offend God. Listen, if you're a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ and you've been forgiven all the sins, past, present, and future, just in Christ, it says we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our sins. But having forgiveness, you and I being bought with a price are not our own. And so therefore, the things that you and I do, the things that you and I say, they matter to God and they should uh, matter to us because it's reflecting either Jesus is Lord of my life or he's not Lord of my life. Listen, when you shake your fist at God and say, I'm going to do whatever I want, God, who's Lord? You are. It's my body. I'm going to do what I want. Uh, it's not your body. You've been bought with a price. And so when you come to this passage, consider the members of your earthly body as dead. Right in the margin of your Bible right there. Circle that word dead. Put up there in the margin. Romans chapter 6. Here is the process of sanctification. The key of justification is believe in Jesus Christ alone. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Sanctification is the process by which you are conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. And you and I are not going to do this perfectly here, but you and I should sin less in this process of sanctification. And when you get to heaven, God is going to kill our bodies, praise God, and you're going to get a new body and it'll be one without sin. But between now and then, we need to consider ourselves dead to sin, number one. Number two, Romans 6, alive to God. And then commit our members, the members of our body, our eyes, our hands, etc., to what is pleasing and righteous in the sight of God. So when we talk about being dead in our earthly bodies, let's notice the list here. God's going to give us a list. The Holy Spirit's not like trying to trick us or make this vague or make it mystical. This isn't mystical at all. If you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to what? Immorality. You look around in our world, our world thrives on immorality. Greek word porneia is just used throughout the Bible to describe there the, the, the sexual activity outside the beautiful confines of marriage that God has created. It. Friends, this is so important. God created them male and female with sexuality. And then it says, and he said to them, Adam and Eve, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. In the intimacy of marriage, there's this beautiful thing that takes place, and part of that outcome is children and grandchildren and generations that are to come afterwards. Listen, God's created sexuality, and you know what he said? It's good. It's very good. But you know what God creates for good? Satan intends for what? Evil. And so he's constantly working all through history. I mean, you read about in the pages of the Bible from Genesis chapter 4 all the way on through the rest of the Scripture, you're going to see immorality, immorality, immorality. But if you're a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, you've trusted Him, 
then sanctification is, is I've got to live different. I once was alive to sin. Now I'm dead to sin in Jesus Christ. Now I need to consider that so and be dead to immorality. Listen, the world's doing everything it can to seduce you. Ladies, there are men out there doing everything they can to seduce you. Ladies, I want you to know that there are, there are ladies who are trying to seduce your husband. I, I don't ever have to argue this with men. Men know that there are other men trying to seduce the, the, their, their wives, their daughters, etc. But ladies, remember this, that there are hussies out there <laughs> who are trying to seduce your husband, and you and your sons, and you should be ticked about it. Listen, Consider the earthly members of your body dead to immorality. And then it talks about impurity. Now this ties closely. These two are tied together. But it's talking about the, the dirtiness of sin. You know, it's very interesting in, in, in my lifetime, as I talk to people, when we talk about other sins, they, they never say in relationship to other sins, this made me feel dirty. But when you start talking about sexual sins, porneia, immorality of whatever form, um, it, it, it's, it's common for people to say, I just feel so filthy. I feel so dirty when I, you know, watching pornography or whatever afterwards. Now, again, never in the moment of sin. There's always a pleasure to sin. But at the end of that, it brings shame and this impurity becomes even known to the person. And then it talks about passions. Uh, again, the word passion can be used for good or it can be used for evil. We can say we're, we're passionate about following God. We're passionate about following Jesus Christ. We're passionate about sports. We're passionate to build a great family. We're passionate to build a healthy church. We're passionate to build a healthy country. Whatever the case might be, there are situations that are good to be passionate about. But here, the passion is in reference to immorality. And think about the passions that our world has to pursue the rebellion towards God in sexual sin. That's what the world does, but it should not be so among us. Evil desires, again, just as these two are connected, these two are connected. This, this passion, this, 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 uh, this drive towards immorality and evil, and then these evil desires and the planning and the strategizing of that. Do people strategize to do evil? Do people think about how they can set evil situations up? Absolutely. And then it moves to greed, be dead to greed. Now, this is a this is an unusual word. In fact, we probably don't even think often of it. But the 10th commandment, um, you shall not covet, Exodus chapter 20, is, is greed. In other words, you want something. You're discontent with, um, with what you have, whether it's on finances or sexuality, whatever the case might be. Discontentment um, in life, that greed, that coveting, that wanting compels people to act in rebellion towards God. And that's idolatry. You know, every time I talk about idolatry, it's the number one sin in the Bible. But when I talk about it, people are like, we live in America, Mark. There's no idols around here. Really? Really? You know what we teach kids in school? The idol of sexual perversion. You know what we're, we're teaching everybody when, uh, what Hollywood's teaching everyone? I mean, just watch. It doesn't matter what you watch anymore. There's always these sexual overtones. Even the cartoons. Friends, I know some of you are thinking, cartoons, they're okay. Bugs Bunny. They don't show Bugs Bunny anymore. They don't show Elmer Fudd. He has a gun. That's bad. You know, the Second Amendment doesn't apply. You shouldn't be able to go out and hunt rabbits. But the new cartoons, I'm telling you, they are so seductive. I was, I was shocked. I'm like, this is, this is pornography. And on and on it goes. That's a form of idolatry. Um, William Barclay, a great writer of the past, put it this way on this passage. He says, if the desire is for money, it leads to being a thief, right? Why is it that people rob banks? Because they coveted something that wasn't theirs. Why did people break into your house? Why did they cut your catalytic converter off? Because they desired money, and so they're willing to steal something from you in order to get that. Um, it says, um, if, if the desire is prestige, they'll have some sort of evil ambition, uh, Whatever, that, whatever is necessary to get that prestige that they think is so important. Um, we see it in the area of sports. We see it in the area of politics and so forth. Um, if the desire is for power, it leads to sadistic tyranny. If the desire is for a person, what? It leads to sexual sin. So, so this, this greed is a form of idolatry, and you see it, you see it throughout 
um, throughout the Bible. And, and you know, that is true in the world, but it shouldn't be true among us, friends. Not if we're followers of Jesus. Ephesians, parallel passage. It says, but if there's immorality or impurity, we've already seen those two words, right? We saw those back in Colossians. Or greed, yeah, we saw that back in Colossians. Must not even be named among you. Listen, the world is going to be immoral. The world's going to be filled with greed. But it shouldn't be so among us. Turn to someone, not among us. Those of you online, not among us. Not among us. And you know what? All of us have probably lived long enough to know someone in a church family that committed some sort of act of immorality or adultery or, or something, and it ended up uh, destroying them, destroying their family, and destroying their church to some capacity. And I can give illustrations of this throughout my life. I remember when Jerry and I were in Bible college, we were going around knocking on doors in this town that, we were, that uh, the college was located, and we'd knock on doors and and, and we would share the gospel with people. And right then, there were some TV evangelists that had gotten in trouble here in the United States. And we would knock on doors, and they'd open the door, and we'd say, you know, um, uh, we'd start to introduce ourselves, and they'd go, you're not a Christian, are you? We know what you people are like, and they'd slam the door. Why? Because immorality was named among the people of God. It's been true all through history. It should not be so. We should be, we should be different. Well, why? Why should we be different? Well, it says right there in the next verse, it says, it is because of these things, this immorality, these passions, these evil desires, this greed, that the wrath of God will come, not may come or, or so, but will come upon the sons of disobedience. Listen, friends, God is going to judge this world for immorality. God is going to judge this world for its evil passions. God is going to judge this world for its idolatry. God is going to judge this world for these things, and it's going to happen. He say, well, how come he hasn't done it? Because he's kind and gracious, not willing that any should perish. But for a time and for a season, until the iniquities are full, the wrath of God will eventually come. You know, I, I, I'm a pastor, you know, and so I'm going to get notes like, you shouldn't talk about the wrath of God. You should say, Jesus has a wonderful plan for your life. He does. To spare you from the wrath of God. That's why he came. You say, what, do you really believe that, Mark? That's what Jesus believed. He says he came to seek and to save that which was lost. The lost are going to experience the wrath of God. Jesus is always about rescuing people. But listen, when you ignore and resist and resist and push back, there's a point where there's no longer the option. That's what it says. The wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. And in them you also once lived. Now listen, don't think too highly and mighty of ourselves. Why? We were among that. But by the grace of God, we would do the same thing. And so we should walk in humility and surrender and obedience to God. Look at these words. Remember back in Ephesians, it used those same words. Porneia, it used impurity, it used greed. It says, let no one deceive you. Here's the reality. It's possible for you and I to be deceived. It's possible for our children to be deceived. And the Holy Spirit is saying here, let no one deceive you with empty words. There's going to be sly, talking people. They're going to come along and they're going to say, you know what? This morality that you're talking about, it's unloving. And you're just mean. And you are just angry. I'm just telling you, I'm just telling you, friends, do not be taken in by these empty words. Was Eve deceived by empty words? We look back and say, oh, Eve, that was a dumb thing to do. How many of you ever read, you know, Genesis chapter 3 and you're just sitting there going, she did it again. Every time I read the chapter, she does it. <laughs> it's like, can you change the script? No, because it's history, right? Now listen, how many of us have ever done something dumb and you sit there and go, that was really dumb? I say it. Mark, that was really dumb. Why did you do that? You probably didn't say that because you wouldn't be using my name, but you know what I'm saying. But... My point is simply this, is don't be deceived by these empty words. For because of these things, the immorality, the impurity, the godless passions, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. It's a fact, friends. It's a fact. And, and there's no way around it. Now listen, you can look through the Old Testament and you see this. Um, you see the sexual perversion, for example, in Genesis 19 with Sodom and Gomorrah. Did God judge that? Yeah. And you know what it says in 2 Peter? It's an example to all of those who will live in sexual perversion outside of marriage. It's a warning to them that God's judgment will come. God recorded that so that people would fear in our day as a nation, as a, as a city-state, that they would do that. And you know what? We've given ourselves over to that. 
Then you start looking through the book of Numbers and the people of Israel. Well, these are God's people. And you remember they get to uh, Mount Sinai. Moses goes up on the mountain to get the Ten Commandments. God tells him, get down to that camp right now. And he goes down, and you remember they're having this, this orgy. They're having this, this immoral party going on, and they're worshiping the golden calf. Idolatry in one area will lead to immorality. It always leads to immorality. And so there's this immorality there, and God deals with them there. You go on a little farther in the book of Numbers in chapter 25, and you see the sin of Baal Peor. How was the nation of Israel destroyed? Why did 24,000 people die in one day because of immorality? This is not a joke. This is just a warning of that which is to come. And that's why you and I should take it seriously. You know, when you think about sexual sins, sexual sins are different than other sins because other sins are outside the body, but immorality is a sin against one's own body. There's something internal in it. God doesn't give us all the details of this, but what he's describing here is that sexual sin is at a whole nother level of sin. And therefore, you and I should flee from it and turn away. Well, how do we do this? How do we mortify it? There's four things I found helpful, and I just quickly want to give them to you. I want to encourage you to write these down because, listen, Satan is a roaring lion seeking him who may devour. How does he devour us? I'm just telling you, think about all the sexual perversion that's happening in our world and around us and in our families and extended families, and we've seen it and we've lived it and we've suffered from it, including what I've seen in my own family. Praise God for His grace in our lives and protecting Jared and I. But I'm just telling you, this is so dangerous. Listen, yeah, number one, flee sexual temptation, flee evil desires. It's one of the few times God says flee something. Normally, it's stand strong, be courageous. But when it comes to sexual sin, run is the answer. Turn to someone. Tell them. Run! Go ahead. You online. Run! We see it with Joseph. Remember? Potiphar's wife's trying to seduce him back in the book of Genesis, chapter 38. And what does he do? He runs. And all through Scripture, he becomes the example of what we're supposed to do. I I always tell people this. An old-timer one time told me, Mark, always be double-booked. If there's ever a time when someone starts, you know, like there's something that's not quite right, remember you're double-booked. You've always got an appointment with God. And if you're double-booked, you always take the most important appointment, right? And, And he described a time... When a person came into his office and tried to seduce him, and he, and he said, I was double booked, and I just, I'm double booked, and I just, he just said, I got up and I ran, ran out to his car, got in his car, drove out into a cornfield, he was, he was uh, in, in uh, Nebraska, drove out in the cornfield, parked the car, and said, God, thank you for delivering me today. And he went back to this passage, be double booked, always. Number two, deny the desires. Proverbs talks to the young man, hey, listen. Um, don't go near the immoral woman's house. Ladies, this applies to you. Don't go near that immoral guy. He might be cute. He might be hot. I'm just telling you, stay away from immoral people. And so you got to deny yourself. You give no opportunity there. So when the opportunity comes, flee. Uh, The rest of the time, deny yourself. There's another element to this, and that's starving your evil desires. And these two are highly related. And I always describe it, you know, like when Jarrah brings home goodies, you know, it's like easy to say, no, I'm not going to have that. But if I don't flee and I don't starve my thoughts of these, these things, then what happens? I came home the other night, had my two grandsons, and my daughter had made a peach cobbler. I walked in, I looked at it. It was speaking to me. <laughs> and now normally I don't like cobblers in the sense because they have, they have these, these horrible crusts around them. So what I do is I just take the piece and I eat the, the yummy guts out of them, right? Amen. You know what I'm talking about? It's kind of like chicken, peel off the skin, right? So, but I was looking at this and it was different. It was like an inch, three quarters of an inch thick. And I'm saying, what's different about that? And I'm not starving, the, I'm, I'm denying myself, but I'm not starving it. Because now I'm asking, tell me about that crust. Why does it look different? Oh, this is like a biscuit crust. And, this, and it is so good, Dad, and really good with ice cream. <laughs> I should have fleed. I was denying, but I stuck around, and then I wasn't starving the desires. And you know what? My son-in-law said, there was a, like a quarter of it there in the pan, and he says, you want this whole quarter? And I said, sure. <laughs> Somehow, Paul, of you are. All right. Number, number four, turn the desires, the godly desires that God gives us in passion. 
towards our spouse. Now listen, if you're single, this is God's design. Now, being single is a good thing. In fact, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, it says it's actually better than being married because then you can serve the Lord in capacities and ways that you can't if you're married. You just got more responsibilities. You got more duties. Truly, I could live on nothing, live in a tent if I didn't have Jared and the family and the kids, right? But the more family you have, the more you, you got responsibility and duty, right? And that's all good, but it, the point of 1 Corinthians 7 is single is great. But here's, here's the deal. It says, if you're single and you don't have self-control in regard to morality, then marry. Um, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with what? Passion. Listen, we are living in a generation that despises marriage and tells young people, hey, you're too young to get married. You can wait till you're 35 or 40. And if you need to have a couple of abortions in between, it's fine. Stupid. God says... Get married, have kids, be blessed. And if that's not, if, gift, if being single isn't your gift, now listen, if you are gifted to be single and you marry, listen, you're going to make someone's life miserable. Do you hear me? This is important. Notice, notice it goes on here in Proverbs 5. What does it say to the young man? Let your fountain be blessed. Rejoice in the wife of your what? Youth. Listen, if you're younger, Find someone who's godly, find someone who's a follower of Jesus, who's not a basket case, who's growing in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, get married, have a family. As a loving hind, a graceful doe, let her breast satisfy you at all times, be exal uh, exhilarated always with her love. For why should, my son, why should you, my son, be exhilarated with, uh, with an adulteress and embrace the bosom of a foreigner? Listen to this. For the ways of a man are before the eyes of the Lord. He watches all his path. God knows what you're doing. You can't hide from God. You know, 1 Corinthians, he's responding to asceticism. Remember those people that came in and said, you know, if you're going to really love God, you're going to deny yourself. You're not going to eat anything good like peach cobbler, and you're not going to, you know, you're not going to get married, and you're not going to have sex, and you're not going to have anything that's, that's good or pleasing, because suffering is really how you become godly. So he's addressing one of those questions in 1 Corinthians 7. Now concerning the things in which you wrote about, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. In other words, it's good to be single. It's good uh, to be uh, celibate all your life and single. That's good. But because of what? Immoralities, right? Immoralities, because of that, each man should have his own wife. Each woman should have her own husband. The husband, doesn't, uh, the husband must fulfill his duty to the wife, likewise the wife to her husband. So here is this display of the affections and the passions that we have. The wife doesn't have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband doesn't have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Stop depriving one another, except by agreement for a time, so that you may devote yourselves to prayer and then come together again, so that what? Satan, listen, Satan wants to mess with you. He wants to destroy you. Satan will not tempt you beyond, uh, will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Friends, I, can, I can't tell you how many times people have said to me, I pushed my spouse into the arms of another person. Hear what God says. Consider yourselves dead to immorality, these, these, these evil passions of this world, and move those passions in a way that is pleasing to God, honoring to Him. And, there, and there's a blessing in that. You know, there's a, a great verse in the book of, in the book of, um, of Hebrews, and it says this, the marriage, that marriage is to be held in honor among all. The world hates marriage. It condemns marriage. It says it's, it's, a, it's a tradition from the past. No, it was created by God. And the marriage bed, that's sex, is to be undefiled. It's to be undefiled. Reminds me of the story of a, of a guy who was driving down the road, and he was going a bit fast, and so his police officer pulled him over. And he comes up to the car, and he says, Sir, um, I'm sorry to pull you over, but you were going a bit fast in there. You know, you're doing 50 and a 30, and so I need your driver's license, and I need your insurance card. And so he hands them to him, and he says, Now, officer, remember what Jesus says. Blessed are the merciful. <laughs> the officer walks back to his car. He says, I will, sir. And walks back to his car, runs the plates and so forth, comes back hands him the driver's license, hands him the insurance card, starts to hand him the ticket, and he says, now, sir, I have to give you a ticket because you're doing 15 to 30. And he says, now, sir, remember what Jesus said, go and sin no more. <laughs> Friends, do me a favor, stand, turn to someone, say, go and sin no more. <laughs> Father, we're thankful that you're the God of heaven and earth, and God, we know that sin is so pervasive. And listen, some of us right now, maybe you're joining us online, some of us right now 
or in a situation where we're compromising morally. Stop it. Desist. Confess that. Some of you need to come up and get prayer right now because the prayer team's up here. Some of you haven't trusted Christ and you've lived a life of immorality. Listen, you need to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and then you need to pursue him and go and sin no more. Friends, God's got something better. Listen, the world is blowing up in its immorality and its wickedness. God's got something better. I saw it as a teenager. I saw it when a husband loved his wife, a wife loved her husband, a couple loved their children, said they're different. There's something radically different. It was Jesus in the Bible. Friends, do something radical. Do something different for the glory of Jesus. Father, I pray that you be with my friends. Show them grace, kindness, and mercy now. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.